Okay. Welcome to our service of worship on Good Friday. We thank all of you for your efforts to uh, keep up with the church as we all uh, combine our efforts to battle the effects of this pandemic. And as always, your church remains ready to assist you with any pastoral need you might have. So please feel free to call the church office at 403-845-3422 to leave a message for the minister or the office staff. Uh, and our elders are ready also to visit you online and uh, uh, talk to you and, and see if there's anything that the church can do for you. We hope that you also join us for our Easter morning service on Sunday and uh, tune into our, our church's website to, to uh, listen to that message. Why do we call it Good Friday? We call it good because of what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross, but it was an awful day for Jesus. He was tried, declared innocent, and condemned anyway. He was whipped almost to death and then led to his crucifixion. Because of Good Friday, the cross we wear is no longer a symbol of, or an instrument of torture rather, but as a reminder of Christ's victory for us. Our sins are forgiven, and we are eternally loved, forever blessed. Thanks be to God. Good morning. This is our call to worship. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God redeems us from sin and death. For us and for our salvation, Christ became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Blessed be the name of the Lord, now and forever. Amen. Let us worship our God. Let us come to God with a prayer of adoration and confession. We come to the foot of your cross and we bow with the disciples. We ponder the mystery of your life and death with Mary, your mother, and proclaim the truth of who you are with those who witness your love in action. We come to you this day because you first came to us. We come loving you because you first loved us. We come to serve you because you first served us. We come to worship you as the Creator, Christ and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and always. You are a God of loving kindness. You sent Christ into the world that we might have life and have it abundantly. Yet, we live lives that are often deadly, certainly less than you would have them be. We allow your world to be filled with violence and terror. Our trust in you is shallow and our faithfulness falters. In the face of uncertainty and trouble, 
we forget your loving kindness governs all things. Forgive who we have been, amend who we are, and direct what we shall be through Christ our Savior and Lord. We pray this through the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Friends, Jesus Christ was betrayed and abandoned. Yet from the cross, he asked God to forgive us. Know that no matter what you have been or what you are now, forgiveness is offered to you this day in Christ Jesus. Accept this forgiveness and share it with others for his name. Here is the good news. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for God to open our hearts to His Word. Source of wisdom and understanding, in the midst of our distractions, let us experience stillness in this place. In the midst of competing voices, let us hear Your Word. In the midst of chaos, we encounter Your presence. Help us to understand Your Word and follow your steps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first word, Luke 23, 33 to 34. When they came to the place called the skull, they nailed Jesus to the cross there, and two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Forgive them, Father. They do not know what they are doing. They do not know what they're doing? They do not know? They who killed Jesus, who are they? Is it so easy to name others to blame? Others the Romans, the crowd, Pilate, Herod, Caiaphas? They all played their part and conspired against Jesus, or simply followed orders to maintain the peace, to keep Jesus' kingdom from infiltrating on theirs. And yet, where are we when Jesus' kingdom infringes on ours? On our peace and our order, on our prosperity and our security. Where are we when the victims of our peace cry for justice? When those disenfranchised by our order call for compassion? When the hungry and the lonely beg us to share our prosperity, our security, our power? Where are we when Christ is crucified among us? Surely he should have raged at the sinners who nailed him to the tree. 
Surely he should have raged at us for the evil we do, the evil we do both knowing and unknowing. Yet compassion is there in the first words that he utters. He intercedes for us before the Father. Compassion that called him into being in his mother's womb. Compassion that compelled him to the cross. Compassion that brings incredible, unbelieving grace. Compassion that echoes through the centuries. To all who participated in the killing of Christ. Compassion that cries out from the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. for what we did but he has done no wrong and he said to Jesus remember me Jesus when you come as king Jesus said to him I tell you this today you will be with me in paradise how much are we like the first thief full of anger because we have, are not rescued from our sin full of hate because we suffer because of the sins of others how much do we want God to snap his fingers and make right what we have made wrong what we have allowed others to make wrong. How easy it is to cry, save us, and rally against God when there is no magic cure, no miraculous recovery, no legions of angels to take away pain and bring wholeness. How easy it is to scorn the Messiah, to mock the goodness of the world and condemn the light of the world because we are not willing to face what we have done. Yet there is goodness. There is a cure for sin, a cure that does not promise magical solutions, but promises that the pain of sin is not the end, that when all this is over, when the suffering is finished, and the final word is not torture, but and defeat, but life, life springing out of the ashes, life transformed and fulfilled in paradise. To the compassionate thief, to the one who could still recognize the good in the world, to the one who tried to comfort and protect the good, to the one who sought good, comfort was given. Today you will be with me in paradise. That's it. Chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. 
Who can grasp the grief? The grief of Mary watching her son suffer. The grief of his mother watching Jesus die. And who can grasp the grief of the son? The son who must see his mother mourn. What gift can the dying son give his mother? What can he offer when he is gone? How can he help her, hold her, comfort her, honor her? Woman, here is your son, he said. Here is one I love, to love you and for you to love. One who knows me, one who is my brother and can speak of me. One who can hold you, comfort you, and honor you. One who shares your grief. Here is your mother. Here is one I love for you to love. One to love you. The one who taught me. The one who fed me. The one who wiped away my tears the one who hugged me, the one who grieves with you. Women, behold your children. Children, behold your mothers. Lord Jesus, you give your life for us. You suffer and die that we might be made whole. darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Of all the agony of that tortuous day, the lacerations of the chaffing of the thorns around his head, the convulsions of his tormented, dehydrated body as he hung in the heat all day. Nothing reaches the depth of this anguished cry of desolation. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus, who found his purpose and strength in the presence of God, who was sustained by the immediacy of his relationship with God, and who endured all by the tangible power of God, always at work within him, always a center of vitality and peace, found himself totally alone on the cross. Jesus, whose very being was God, found himself utterly, absolutely, despairingly cut off from all that gives life and breath, cut off from all that gives purpose and hope, cut off from the source of his being, cut off even from himself, plumbing the depths of the human condition to walk in the place of the utter absence of God, in the place of sinners, in the place of those who reject God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In these words is the central mystery of the crucifixion, which cannot be fully comprehended, that there is no despair so deep or evil, so overwhelming, or place so far removed from joy, light, and love from the very heart of God, that God has not been before us and where God cannot meet us 
and bring us home. timelessness about hanging on a cross. It is not a quiet death over in an instant or in a glorious moment of martyrdom like being torn apart by lions. A cross is as much an instrument of torture as it is the gallows from which to hang. And to the day wears on seconds stretch into minutes which stretch into hours and until there comes a point when time can no longer be measured, except in the gradual weakening of the body, and it is ever more insistent demands for substance, which is so vital to life, so foundational to all the living things, so basic to existence as we know it, water. Water to moistened a parched mouth, water to free the swollen tongue, water to open a raspy throat that cannot grasp gasp enough air water to keep hope alive to keep life alive just a few minutes longer water to a crucified man is life O lord thou art my god i seek thee my soul thirsts for thee my flesh faints for thee as in a dry and weary land where no water is who can tell if these words from Psalm 63 went through Jesus' mind? But the thirst for water is a thirst for life, and a thirst for life is a thirst for God, who promises streams in the desert, mighty rivers in the dry land, living water to wash away every tear. Here, at the end of it all, these promises seem far away, distant, and yet Jesus, forsaken by God, still clings to the memory and the hope of life, I thirst. This is the, the sixth word taken from John chapter 19, verses 29 and 30. A bowl was there full of cheap wine mixed with vinegar. So a sponge was soaked in it, put on a stalk of hyssop and lifted to his lips. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. What a sigh of relief. What a cry of deliverance that finally, after seemingly endless pain and gasping torment, it is over at last. The suffering is ended, the ordeal is finished, and nothing remains but the blessed peace of the absence of all sensation. When all there is is pain, its ceasing is the greatest blessing of all, even when its ceasing comes only with death. But Jesus' cry is more than just welcoming the ending of pain. It is more than joy at the deliverance death brings. He does not merely say, it is over. He says, it is accomplished. It is fulfilled. It is achieved. Jesus' cry isn't a cry of defeat and despair. 
It is a cry of success and triumph, even at the moment of death that the race has been run, that he is endured to the end, that the strife is over and the battle is won. Jesus' cry is a cry of relief, to be sure, but it is also a cry of victory. The work I came to do is complete. There is nothing more to add. It is Verse 46, Jesus' seventh word on the cross. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. It is the end, the very end, the end of the ordeal, the end of the suffering, and Jesus alone on the cross, tortured, exhausted, abandoned by his friends, forsaken by God, gaps for a last breath and gathers the strength for one final cry. Why would he choose to speak so close to the end? Why would he muster the last energy? He had to cry out with a loud voice. Couldn't God have heard his thoughts? Unless God wasn't the only one intended to hear. Unless his voice was pitched loud so that we too might hear this final dedication of his soul. A dedication made despite the pain, despite the mocking, despite the agony, despite the sense of horrible aloneness he felt. A dedication made to God before the resurrection before the victory of the kingdom, before any assurance other than that which faith could bring. Jesus entrusts his spirit, his life, and all that has given it meaning to God in faith, even at the point of his own abandonment, when the good seems so very far away, he proclaims his faith in God. The darkness cannot Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Lord Jesus, you gave your life for us. You suffered and died that we might be made
God of peace within our lives and relationships. In our communities and this world, we face conflict and antagonism. Today we pray for all places where violence and cruelty seem to win the day, for countries where war cuts down people, and for relationships marked by cruelty. Loving God, give us peace in our time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God of hope, whenever the world is confusing and bleak, you pierce the darkness with hope and renewed vision. We give you thanks for lessons learned, for changes of heart, for new discoveries made and hope restored. As we mark Jesus' death this day, we pray for those who are ill and dying, for those who are bereaved or feel any burden of loss. Renew our trust in your resurrecting love. We give you thanks for those who have died and abide with you. Keep us united with them and bring us to you at the last. Loving God, give us hope in our time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Spirit of God, we pray for the Church of Christ here and throughout the world, united in witness and service, where it is an error or enthrall to idolatry or cruelty, restore its vigor and grace. Nurture our calling to unique ministries wherever we serve. Loving God, give us courage in our time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O creator of joy, we thank you for our moments of joy and celebration, for pleasure given and received, for times of quiet reflection. We remember before you those who are lonely or bitter and those who must walk through dark valleys. Be their light and their warmth. Melt our hearts to love anyone in difficulty more deeply. Loving God, give us joy in our time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O love, from heaven to earth come down. You call us to live in communion with you and one another. We remember before you our families, whether we are close or estranged, and our friends, whether nearby or far away. Bless all the relationships that sustain us and bring your love close by. Loving God, give us love in our times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen.
let us go with God's blessing. Depart now in peace and may the Spirit of Christ go with you. May his faith and trust abide within you and may the knowledge of his love support you both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>